Hello, and thank you so much for joining us for this conversation between the esteemed authors Elizabeth McCracken and Yi Yun Lee. My name is Andrew Porter, and I'm the director of the Creative Writing Program at Trinity University in San Antonio, where I also teach fiction writing. And I'm just delighted to be here today to introduce and listen to these two extraordinary writers. Uh, before we get started, just a few things to mention. We hope you'll consider purchasing Elizabeth McCracken and Yi Yun Lee's books from Nowhere Bookshop, the book festival's bookseller. Independent bookstores have had a hard time during the pandemic, so we hope you'll support them and these writers and the festival by purchasing their excellent books. Just click on the Buy the Book button on the festival site and you should be set. I also want to remind you that if you have questions, just go ahead and place those questions in the Q&A box and they will be answered in order. Now, I'm going to disappear here in just a moment and watch this conversation myself. But before I do, I wanted to briefly introduce these two distinguished writers in conversation today and tell you a little bit more about them. First, Yi Yun Lee is the author of four novels, including her latest, Must I Go? Two collections of stories and a memoir. She has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Whiting Foundation, and the MacArthur Foundation and has won many awards, probably too many to list here, including the Penn Jean Stein Award, the Penn Hemingway Award, and a Wyndham Campbell Prize. She currently teaches at Princeton University, and if you're like me, you've been reading her work with great enjoyment for many years. And I wanted to add, too, that in, in addition to being one of my favorite writers, Yi Yun Lee is also one of those writers who really celebrates reading and the healing or restorative power of literature. Right at the start of the pandemic, for instance, she started a book club through the Literary Journal, a public space in which she invited people, 3,000 people from around the world to be specific, to join her in reading and talking about Tolstoy's War and Peace over a three month period, chiefly with the goal of finding comfort and perspective and understanding through literature at a time when the world was so uncertain. So I can't think of a better person to have here today in conversation with Elizabeth McCracken about Elizabeth's new book, Then Yi and Lee. Elizabeth McCracken is the author of seven books, including Thunderstruck and Other Stories, winner of the 2014 Story Prize and longlisted for the National Book Award, The Giant's House, a National Book Award finalist, Bowl Away, and most recently, in fact, just this very month, the Souvenir Museum, her new collection of short stories, which is largely what this event is here to celebrate. Her stories have appeared in Best American Short Stories, won three Pushcart Prizes, a National Magazine Award, and an O. Henry Prize. She has served on the faculty of the Iowa Writers' Workshop and currently holds the James Michener Chair for Fiction at the University of Texas at Austin. Author Nick Hornby describes Elizabeth McCracklin as one of his favorite writers and Pulitzer Prize winning novelist Paul Harding declares, Elizabeth McCracken is a national treasure. And I would have to agree on both counts. She is both one of my favorite writers and indeed a national treasure. I know that I always get excited when I see a new story of hers appear in Zoetrope or some other distinguished magazine. And I remember just recently the excitement that I felt when I encountered and devoured her brilliant short story it's not you in the latest edition of the best american short stories that story was not only one of the best short stories of 2020 but a standout among the other stories in the volume and like all of mccracken's work it was hilarious gorgeously written emotionally complex and honest and distinguished by a remarkable sensitivity and a timeless wisdom and grace it prompted me to immediately check and see if elizabeth mccracken had a new collection of short stories coming out soon always a cause for celebration, and indeed she did. The Souvenir Museum, a collection that not only contains that brilliant story, It's Not You, but 11 others just as extraordinary and beautiful and hilarious. So if you haven't already, I hope you will pick up a copy of the Souvenir Museum and check out the other remarkable books by both of these phenomenal writers who are truly two of the most important and revered writing today. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming them now, Elizabeth McCracken and Yi Yun Lee. Thank you, Andrew. I'll take from here. 
thank you for that beautiful introduction. And I just want to, I just want to chime in with Andrew about this new book, the souvenir, the souvenir museum, which is coming up this coming week, Elizabeth. Yes, yes. yes. I want to. I just want to report to the audience my reading experience of this book, and then I'll turn to you. And I, well, I have had two weeks of reading this book, which has become a most extraordinary experience for me. I usually spend five hours a day reading, and on Friday I called my friend and said. I've been really slow reader these days because Elizabeth's stories make reading any other book impossible at the moment. So I have been reading one story at a time. And in general, I feel like I am a polygamous reader, you know, going from like a bee going from flower to flower. But with this book, well, I, I actually I'm going to borrow Elizabeth's favorite uh, metaphor for bird metaphor. I'm like the hummingbird, just getting uh, getting attached to one feeder day in and day out. I'm just sitting there with this one feeder reading these stories. And that's if not already extraordinary for me. And I think something else happened in the past two weeks. I have been writing so much more than I have ever done in my entire career. And so it is was work, these stories make me want to write. Other than reading these stories, all I did in the past two weeks was just writing and writing and writing. And so I, I'm, I'm sorry, this is such a long blurb to your book. And I think Elizabeth, the shortest blurb is Elizabeth McCracken's work makes me want to write. So that's my experience of reading this story collection. And I I'm sure many readers will agree with me. So that's it. That's my introduction to the collection. So I'm going to ask you a few questions about the collection and some general questions. Oh my gosh, that means the world to me. Not only do you like the stories, but like if on, on my resume is that if I indirectly caused there to be more Yi Yun Lee writing in the world, <laughs> that would make me really happy. <laughs> it's, it's a strange thing also about being, um, talking on screen and I'm one of those people that if we're on Zoom, which we're not right now on a different platform, I immediately turn off my camera so I don't have to look at like what dumb face I'm making when I moved. So thank you very much. I, at one point I went like this and I went, that, that looks terrible. <laughs> thank you, that, that, really, that just means that, that means the world to me. It's, Thank you. It's extraordinary in, in, in a way that I cannot explain. And so, but let's come to the story, the Souvenir Museum. The stories in, in this collection are set in many places. And I counted roughly six, seven countries, many cities, and several boat trips, you know, in the <laughs> ocean and also in the swimming pool in Texas. And so, but these, all these external places often point to the inter interior center of the characters where geography does not solve a problem or a conflict. And character, characters going from one place to another oftentimes, not only as the cliche says, leave the past behind, they do not leave the past behind, but they take the past with them in a messier form. So I want to read just quickly one sentence in the story, in the collection. This is from the story, the last story. So the characters are talking about traveling. Why could ever, st what could ever stop them from traveling in this wide world? Plenty, it turned out, themselves, the world, the people in charge. So can you, Elizabeth, indulge us because we have been our non-traveling selves for this past, 12, 13 months, and can you talk about the geography in your stories and the mapping of the exterior world with the character's interior, conflicts and motives and history? 
and especially you know your your epigraph also talks about map the idea of travel the very idea so let's just start with the wide world and why we're stopped from going into the wide world you know uh, that um that sentence you just read is the last sentence that i wrote for the entire book um, because i felt like and it felt like a really hard balance it, i wrote it after the start of the pandemic because i felt like this book has so much travel in it that it was feeling like science fiction to me all of a sudden and that some there had to be some reference to it but i was also at that point had no idea how long it would last and was trying to write a sentence and it might be it might be a, too too subtle but a sentence that would make sense no matter how the next months panned out and i think a lot i i tend to write short stories in my head when i'm traveling which though so many of these stories came about because I was somewhere with Edward and the kids and I was thinking, okay, yeah, here I am on another boat. I think <laughs> it's good. Boats are, boats are really good for short fiction. And, um, and I, I think I'm interested in that because of that question of taking yourself out of context and understanding yourself in a different way. And it's not that you're, your interior life disappears when you're out of context. Indeed, I think you can look at it more closely in a way. Um, I was talking to a friend and I feel like, you know, for the past year or so, I've only been in context. I've been everywhere where you would expect to find me at my house or teaching or, you know, in an armchair or napping. And, um, and those I have, I'm lucky. I have very nice contexts be in but i miss myself out of context partially because i do think you you think vividly when you travel and when you, you're not in your your same spot and i i was also when i was putting together this collection i realized how many travel stories there were and i had this sudden sensation of like okay i can't do that by accident i have to try to do it on purpose, and I remember when I, I read the Brenda Shaughnessy poem that's the epigraph, a, a map of itself, I thought, this solves all my problems. It'll tie it all up exactly, because I love that poem, and, and I love Brenda Shaughnessy's work so much. Um, because before that, it was sort of a collection of stories of ideas that occurred to me when I was somewhere interesting or somewhere terrible, like Legoland, um, and found myself thinking thing, thinking the thoughts I don't think at home. Has being in context changed your writing in the past year, since we are so in context at this moment? I, you know, I, I haven't written a short story in the past year. Okay. And originally I thought, because I was on leave in the fall, and I thought, oh, I'll write some short stories. And I worked on two small things but but book length um and i think that that's a big difference for me is that i haven't written a short story i don't have a short story that i intend to write and i don't know otherwise do you feel like not going anywhere has has changed your writing it has changed my dream landscape <laughs> all my anxiety dreams and good dreams are all about traveling at this moment <laughs> Well, to follow up on that structure of the collection of stories, I, this is the, you know, as I said before, I read from the beginning to the, I have seen several of the stories in magazines when they first came out, but this time, reading from the first story to the last, this is probably the first time a collection and its structure makes sense to me. I mean, people always ask how you put together a collection of stories, and never quite, I didn't, ever understand that question but this time i sort of understand the question by reading from the beginning to the end so i want to comment particularly about the five stories about sadie and jack so there are five stories i don't know if some of the audience may have seen the irish wedding in this week last week in the atlantic monthly and with sadie and jack there are five stories about sadie and jack in, at different moments of their lives 
and I did not know they are going to be scattered. So I was just reading a story and then I encountered them again. And then I encountered them again in another context. And by the end, I thought, well, this, the collection has a novelistic feeling that we have, I mean, City and Jack, the story of City and Jack are, are like those white stones, you know, Hansel and Gretel put there for me to follow. And yet, while I follow their little white stones in the white, and then I meet all these other characters in the other stories, they're like, they're like alternative stories of Sadie and Jack. These are the people Sadie and Jack will not be mm -hmm. or might have met on the trip. Or, you know, I, I, I would like to hear your thoughts about how you put these stories together, especially when you decided, you know, there might be more than one Sadie and Jack story in the collection. That's so interesting to think of the other people as people they might have met because I think it's true and I also think I really, I am such a bumbler as a writer that there's, there aren't that many decisions that I made in, make intellectually, partially because I've tried to make decisions intellectually and that's when my work feels mm -hmm. to me forced or rickety or, um, yeah, just not, not well made or true and i feel like the decisions i make i make intellectually are outside of the composition trying to to read stuff that is interesting trying to this is i i miss museums so much i do a lot of writing in my head in museums as well the city and jack stories were the the last stories that i wrote um and i wrote them together i drafted them all quite quickly, actually on consecutive days in a way that I haven't normally written. And then I revised them for quite a while afterwards. But there was something about writing them quickly and loosely, which is not normally the way that I write stories. I usually finish a story and move on to the next, the next one. And I didn't do that with these. Um, that was, I have to say, deeply pleasurable because sort of in the way that I write novels, that I'll write something in a novel and I'll think, okay, that's not right, but I'll fix it later. And usually with short stories, I, well, I'm, this is the one thing I'm working on, so I'll have to fix it. Uh, but they didn't, I wrote them in a different order than they're in the book. So I didn't know exactly how I was going to space them. And I wrote them in a different order. And, and actually, Paul Lissicky, my, my friend and your friend, um, is the one he, he read in, uh, early version of the manuscript and he's the one who suggested the order um which i think is right and i think also almost seems purposeful because it the first story has a wedding in it the last story has a wedding in it um and those are also the two stories in which the characters that there there's a a couple um sadie and jack um were there together um it's, there's no origin story in it those two things. Um, and I don't, I mean, as a teacher, I feel like I'm always telling my students there's a certain amount of work that you just can't do with the front part of your brain. You have to use your, the back part of your brain. So it's not that I think, oh, what a coincidence. That's the way it worked out. I think there was that I knew something that it made sense for those book stories to be bookends, but that if I had consciously thought of them, as speaking to each other, they wouldn't have actually spoken to each other. It would have been like a forced, a forced conversation right. between the stories. Well, however you came around to make that happen, I just want to describe the experience for me as when I hit the last story, you know, I, I cannot give the story away. I cannot spoil the story, but all of a sudden when I read to, to the end, I have to go back to the beginning to reread the collection because I want to see those characters at the last story, in the last story. They departed in the last story, but they were there at, at the beginning and I didn't no, pay enough attention to them at the beginning. So I just thought it's, it's what a novel does to a reader, except this is more than what a novel does because oftentimes when we read to the end of the novel, we 
get what I think we get almost everything. But here I feel that no, I need to read the book a second time to get one more time these characters' lives. So I, I just want to say it's such a just the reading experience. So I, you know, it, a reader has to read from the beginning to the end. You know, follow these stories. So can I ask? About nature in your story, particularly yes. birds. <laughs> I would like for you to read just the, a couple paragraphs about birds. Sure. If you can indulge me. One is on page 34 and one is on page 161. To page 34 is the puffins. Did you, just, where do you the, the, I'm just thinking the first paragraph on page 34. So these yeah. are the characters uh, going on a boat trip to an island in Scotland to see puffins. Puffin therapy they're having. White-breasted, orange-beaked, hopping along the ground, birds the size of books, size of books, puffins, dozens of them. So many you couldn't count or see them as individuals. They constituted mere puffinosity. People walked right up and took pictures. They were not seagulls nor pigeons who begged for food or stole it, they were merely the locals, accustomed to the seasonal influx of gawkers. Patient, accessible. They could fly, but chose not to. David pulled out his phone. He almost laughed when the bird in front of him appeared on the screen. And that's the puffins. And the Gracos is 161. The first paragraph. I took a screenshot of that paragraph and sent to a friend. I think that the paging is a little different. Is this the one that begins all grackles were beautiful? Some some grackles might possess souls and some grackles might. Yeah. This is so, and the pages are, so I'll read that first paragraph. The pages are yeah. different in the first book. Oh. Um, some grackles might possess souls and some grackles might possess intelligence, but it was impossible to believe that any one grackle possessed both. Not enough room in their brillantined heads. A clatch of them walked unnervingly around the parking lot outside the vintage store like a family at a hotel wedding, looking for the right ballroom. One grackle was missing a foot, and Thea blamed him for it. If they had been magpies, she might have counted them up, wondering what they foretold, but grackles were just seagulls in widow's weeds. They weren't omens of anything except more grackles. Thank you. I will always hear Bracco as a seagull with widow's weeds. <laughs> I, the reason I, I, I mentioned these two, I and mean, there are other parts about nature. I remember when I was in your workshop years and years ago, you said something about, I'm not interested in nature, but I may be paraphrasing you. But I'm I sure thought, <laughs> but I, when I was reading this, of course, your previous work too, I thought, no, this cannot be a writer who's not interested in nature. This is just a writer who's not interested in nature written in a certain way. So can you talk a little bit about, I'm just, this is not a question, it's just out of curiosity. I just would like to, to see what, what to know what you see in nature and writing about nature. Yeah, let me think about it because I'm sure I said exactly that. And even now, the way I am interested in in nature is like the, like parking lot, like where nature is in parking lots. Um, I mean, I like nature. Uh, I guess well enough. Um, I don't like to camp, and um, but I the maybe particularly the older I get. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what makes the world weird. That may, in fact, be like the, the motto that is stitched on my, my writerly coat of arms is, let's find out, you know, trying to describe what makes the world weird. And birds are so weird. And the older I get, the more I'm sort of fascinated by, if you invented birds, people wouldn't believe them. <laughs> Um, they're so, they're strange and beautiful and unnerving. And I'm also, it may also be related to being out of context. I feel like if you're a human being and you're looking at birds, you have to acknowledge 
that you're actually not the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, you lack skills that other animals have. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, there are birds all through this collection, and I was astounded when I realized how many. There are, there are little, literal birds. There's a story in which puffins play a major role and one that which grackles play a major role, but there's also lots of references to birds. Um, and I think it's just because I admire how very, how strange and how various they are as well. Yes. I remember there's a moment when Jack was in the bar with Sadie and he described American drink with a long straw that you can drink from the, the glass like a hummingbird. <laughs> I will always remember that the hummingbird image again. I, you know, I, I think the reason I'm asking the question is, I feel sometimes I read people's work in nature as in their, probably not as nature in the parking lot, and my eyes just glaze over the words, the beautiful words or the beautiful images. And I think maybe your nature sort of makes me think again, wait, I have missed a lot of things. I missed how strange the birds are <laughs> and how the puffins, the puffins look at the human being and say, why are you here? And <laughs> you're so odd. We are odd. Well, speaking, I mean, I think this is a continuation of the bird theme. You just, uh, you recently reviewed a <laughs> book, bird centered book, but I want to read one sentence from I think this is my 231. I'll read it. It's, it's the last book, the last story of the book. So it's Sadie reading a book on a trip. The sentence is, the book had been recommended by a friend and Sadie found it simultaneously fascinating and boring, a near and mere transcript of life. I, I was elated when I, when I saw that. I thought, oh yes, that's why some fiction, is, they're just transcripts. And then in this New York Times re book review, you review the novel. I must say this is probably one of the best reviews I've ever read for the longest time or in memory. And in, in the review, I'm going to read Elizabeth's your review. For me, the book feels accurate. There are anecdotes here that illustrate life, but have no effect on events. We live in a golden age of accurate fiction, not realism. This could happen, but accuracy, it probably did happen. I don't dismiss accuracy in fiction. Many people love it. I want to, I wonder if you could just elaborate on the difference between realism and accuracy and the realistic fiction and accurate fiction. Let me see if I can, it's funny, because I was in my, in the, um, I'm teaching a novel workshop um, mm -hmm. at the University of Texas. I used to teach it at the University of Iowa, and I, this is my first time mm -hmm. teaching it um, at UT, and we were talking about realism, and I, I'm never satisfied with the term realism, because it is, realistic fiction isn't necessarily actually realistic, um, and what is realism for somebody is not realistic for other people. But there's the, for me, the, the, the difference is that realistic fiction, I'm using this term I don't like, mm -hmm. a, a lot, you know, there really should be a better term for it, but there's a kind of fiction which is, you know, I, I love all sorts of fiction in which you read it and you fall into the world of the fiction and it feels like our world, but the world itself is engulfing. Um, and you're, you're, you're just in, inside of it and you're not wondering what's true and what's not true. The events that happen in the book are happening to the characters and to you. And for fiction that is, that's only accurate, it feels to me that it it feels like um, it feels like photorealism. That is to say, you go, wow, that looks just like that. That is a duplication of somebody's life. But you're always aware of the life that it's duplicated. If you know what I mean, you don't you don't fall into the book itself because it's mirror image. 
and and only Alice can enter the mirror. And when I read those books, I never actually fall into the world of them. I admire the detail and I I can be moved by it. But if it's more interested in accuracy, again, it feels purely reflective and not immersive, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it makes absolute sense. And I mean, I always think about fiction, you know, the, the fiction I love, the characters always have alternatives and they just happen to be living in this world and in this life. And the accurate fiction, as you said, is photorealism. They actually do not, I, I feel like in those fiction, characters do not have alternatives. They just have one fate to live out their story. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I have to say, because I was thinking about this, because the for when I was writing that book review, because it's by a tremendously talented writer with incredibly interesting thoughts, and I don't think it's it, it's merely accurate. Also, when it comes to accurate fiction, it takes a huge amount of skill and a lot of work. It happens not to be the thing that I read fiction for, mm -hmm. like that it's something that I, that that I don't particularly enjoy the experience of um, because I do, I want to, I want to fall in. <laughs> I don't like photorealism either. As I, when I look at photorealism, I'm aware of how hard it must have been to get it that accurate. Right. Well, I certainly fell into your book, Elizabeth. I want to, I think there are uh, really good uh, questions from the audience. I'm going to ask some audience questions and I have more questions, but I would uh, encourage um, the audience to ask questions. I think Susan B. Stinson asked, being a, <laughs> hi Susan, being a bumbler as a writer is so interesting. Does bumbling or making decision intuitively apply to your process on a sentence level or word by word? as well as on the level of structure for the whole manuscript. Is it a dance between the back part of the brain and the front part of the brain on every level? Yeah, I think, thanks, thanks, Susan. Susan Stinson, uh, one, of my, yeah. one of my favorite writers. Um, I, uh, I am not, I'm always, because language is incredibly important to me um, as a writer, but I'm not somebody who really labors over my sentences. I mean, I, I put in commas. I'm always having arguments with myself about semicolons. But generally speaking, with a sentence, I get it right the first time or I don't get it right at all. I do have to, like like everybody, I have to go through a manuscript and see how many times I use the word tender, one of my favorites, and how often I used always, whether I repeated a particularly picturesque word um, but I don't, when people say I worked for four hours and I wrote a paragraph, I always think, oh gosh, that sounds awful. Um, <laughs> because I'm more likely to, I think it's quite possible that I could write six hours and by the time I, um, the book is finished, I'm left with a paragraph. I think it's it's labor put in in different times as so much is in in writing, but at least in those first drafts, I I I I hope the sentences are coming without me uh, without too much intellectual effort, and then I go back and fix things. Now there's a follow up question from Susan Stinson. <laughs> Not a question about which we just talked about. Also feels like a question about the souls and intelligence of grackles and whether they can contain those. Are grackles maybe bumblers? <laughs> I think grackles know exactly what they're doing. What do you feeling? They're up to no good at all times. I love grackles, I have to say. <laughs> but they seem, grackles seem very intentional to me. 
<laughs> I'm going to, I, I need to write that down. <laughs> yes. You, you know, I think you just answered my question about your process, but I want to ask you about short story in general. When you teach, when you write short story, when you read a story, what do you look for in the short story? I mean, if you're looking for short fiction. I mean, I feel like um, my favorite short stories and your short stories are among my favorite short stories. I I want stories that suggest the entire lives of the characters behind the momentary and the notion that we're seeing these short story these characters not on the most representative day of their life but on the maybe the least representative but that the short story itself manages to tell me what's rep you know what what they are like not necessarily on this day um yeah and that's i mean that's the thing that i'm i'm most interested in and maybe that's also sort of an answer to the question about accurate fiction that accurate fiction is often about the quotidian um and i love daily detail and fiction of all sort but in terms of short stories i really am interested um in i always tell my my students that the most important quest question of short fiction is the first question of the passover seder which is why is this night different from all other nights and that I, I look for stories that answer that question. Can I add my answer to that using yes, your stories? Please. I was I was recently on a judging panel on the short stories, and I mean, sometimes you read the story perfectly fine, and I said, well, I just don't love it because it does not it does not leave any damage on me. It has not wounded me. Another judge said, well, that's a lot you ask from a short story to wound you. And I would like to say, you know, the, the stories in the Soviet Union Museum, when I was reading it, I think every story wounded me. But that's not the only thing. I also, I was led up to look up puffins on internet. I was also trying to see if I could do some ventriloquism on my own. <laughs> And I was thinking about folding, you know, balloon animals. There are so many things you look for in a short story, but I, I think in the end, all your stories, they take up space. I think when you say you want to know the characters have, the characters have lives behind them. And the characters in these stories have years of lives, their family, their grandparents and parents, so the natural history of home is there. Even sometimes they're just alone on a boat. You can still feel that. And I think that's what I look for in a short story. And every story really fits the bill. Thank you. I'm very wounded by you, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> but um, let's see. OK, hold on. I think there is a question. I don't want to miss people's questions. Do you find the fiction of lives on Twitter as compelling as other fictions? The fictional lives. Do you find the fiction of lives on Twitter as compelling as other fictions? Partly, yes. I do, I love Twitter. Um, I love Twitter for a lot of different reasons, but I don't think fiction is one of them. I love it because I get um, uh, reading suggestions from Twitter and I get to have interesting relationships with people, both writers and others that I feel like I wouldn't have otherwise. But I don't, and there are some people who are on Twitter who write really well on Twitter. But I feel like I go to it for a different reason than I, than I read fiction for. I don't know. I'm sorry. If, that doesn't answer a person's question. Yeah. But it's an attempt. That's, it's a good attempt. Oh, 
Oh, the questions all just disappeared. Okay, sorry. <laughs> there's, there's, you know, there's someone behind the screen, which is really strange. I want to talk about, you know, there's a, there's a one story you wrote when you were 22 called "It's Bad Luck to Die" in your first collection, and it is what I told you. I have been teaching that story every semester in my entire teaching career. I never, uh -huh. told, I would never tell my students how young you were when you wrote that story. And at the end of the teaching, and when everybody loved the story so much, I would tell them, I said, Elizabeth wrote it when she was 22. And I just like to do that to the students to intimidate them. But I want to quote, there's one sentence from that story. My life drove my mother crazy. All she wanted was for me to become miraculously blank. I broke her heart, that was my job. She let me know her heart was broken. That was her job. I could, I could probably memorize that. How, do you feel you have changed or not? You have not changed since 93 as a writer. <laughs> I'm just curious. That, and that story is the first story I wrote when I was in Alan Gerganis's workshop um, at the University of Iowa. Um, and and it was much different from any story I'd written before then. And a couple of years ago, I was giving a reading at a university and it was, it happened to be Valentine's Day, mm -hmm. um, which also meant that on campus, there was a performance of the vagina monologues. So there was almost nobody, I'm not saying that my reading would have been <laughs> filled up, but there was maybe even, there was a little overlap of, of um, students interested in the written word who were not, not, uh, didn't come to my reading. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is a love story. I'm going to read this story. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting to me that I couldn't get the, as I was reading it aloud, I couldn't get the rhythm of the sentences right. Uh, that something had shifted in the, my internal I guess just the, the way that I hear fiction that I, I read really badly because I had forgotten what it felt like to write those sentences. So that's one thing that has changed. Another is that my first collection is mostly first person mm -hmm. and I'm working actually on two first person things. But in this story, there's a single first person story. And in my last collection, there was one first person singular story and one first person plural story. Um, I don't, it's not that I think I've improved, but I think to, to think about how you feel about this, because your work has shifted in sort of the things that you're interested in. Your interest, you know, it would be terrible if we were all interested in the exact things that we were interested in when we were 20 or were only using the same methods. It's not, and again, I don't think it's necessary that, that we improve, but you change. Yeah, I think you have to change. Yeah, I do think so. I have to, can I just read a lot one of my favorite sentences from the book? Because I took a shot and sent to my friend. So this is in the story Proof, the puffin story. The only solution for fear was stubbornness. His mother had taught him that. She had raised him to believe in the power of obstinacy. And I thought, well, yes, I think, I, I do think we, we change, but there's some, there's some certain belief in the power of obstinacy. I think the stubbornness, I really do think all your characters are quite stubborn. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> As most of my characters do. I guess we are interested in the stubborn characters. Yeah. Because those are the characters who keep on doing things. Yes. Grace Paley, Elizabeth, I, I would like to hear you just talk succinctly about Grace Paley, and I want to make a confession. I first read Grace Paley in your workshop. I didn't get it when I was that age. I knew you, I knew you loved her, and I just couldn't, I, I couldn't get it. And I, I think I only got it five years ago, and all of a sudden, yeah. everything makes sense to me. So I want to, I want you to talk briefly about Grace Paley. Do you know, that's so funny because I was talking to um, somebody who um, I'm working on his thesis, Willie Fitzgerald, who's 
uh, uh, Michener Center fellow, and he said that he'd read a Grace Paley story that I'd recommend, and he was like, I, you know, I just don't, I don't get her, and and we overlap in a lot of our taste, the, the people who mean a lot to us. And I said, you know what? I don't think you have to. I feel like um, not every writer is for everyone. And also when it comes to Grace Paley's work, I can't explicate my love. And I think those loves are very deep. Those ones where you sort of think both, I can't explain it to you, but also it's okay if you don't, if you don't love her. Um, I, I love her and that's, and that's fine. It's a private thing. Um, and it is because she's so idiosyncratic and, um, in particular, um, and she means a lot to me, but there's my favorite story of hers, Gloomy Tune, is a story that I could not explain to anybody else why it's good. And I often give it to students and they will say either, oh my gosh, that's uh, the most amazing story I've ever read, or they'll go, oh. <laughs> um, and they, they don't, they're both good people, both <laughs> categories of, of uh, students. Yeah. I think there's one more question for both writers, but why don't you answer it? Is there a theme or an answered question from your childhood or family history that you find haunts your fiction? I think we have to, I see Karen, and I think it's 2.47. You know I oh, used yes. to be a librarian, so I'm going, the library is closing now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it would be okay to go a few more minutes. I think it would be okay. Well, we were hoping just to have the question haunting us. <laughs> what haunts you from your childhood? Yeah. The ventriloquism dummies. <laughs> yes. How about you? I don't know, like, I'm not one of the twins. I'm not one member of, or one half of a twin. It's still haunting me. <laughs> mm. Yes, oh, I think, I think, Thank you, everyone, for coming. I really, again, I'm just going to pop up my book and look at all the colors I've marked. It's just an extraordinary book. I cannot say enough about this book. Ian, this has meant the world to me. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, I'm quite wounded at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Thank, Thank you. you Karen. Thanks to both yes. of you. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.